we're going to give everyone just a couple more minutes to join the class, but welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to see each and every one of you. We've had a wonderful devotion, and uh, you probably remember from last week that I'm just going to call on folks to participate. Let me just say, this is not something that John Black made up. Back in the day, when Jesus was a baby, and you went to the uh, board of examiners, they would just grab a candidate and say, candidate, you're singing a song. Candidate, you're going to read scripture. Candidate, you're going to preach a sermon. And they did that randomly. And so at any time that you were with the board of examiners, your name might get called. You know what? They even did it at the annual conference. So while you were standing in front of the bishop, the bishop might say, take a text and preach for the next three to five minutes. That actually how the board was ran back in the day. So I'm just taking a little bit of that and bringing it to us. And uh, last week, uh, Brother Cole uh, was with us, but not able to fully verbally participate. So I'm going to call on Brother Cole right now if he'll open us up with a prayer. Maquan, can you do that? I don't drive it home, but I can still do a prayer. <laughs> I don't want you to wreck. Uh, can you pull over before you pray? <laughs> I, can, I can do that. All right. Let, let us pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for us bringing us together again. Lord, we had a thousand times we couldn't tell you thank you enough. Lord, we just say thank you for what you're doing and get ready to do right now in our lives, Lord. So we just know that you are all time, on time, God, Lord. We just say we thank you for having a blessed session. And everyone receive your word as you say, amen. Amen. Well, we thank him for that wonderful prayer. Uh, just a little housekeeping and we'll get started. Um, your assignment was due actually midnight last night, and uh, we're going to grade the assignments, of course, with grace. So for those who turned their assignments in on time, the top maximum grade you can get is 100%. And if you did everything but might have needed a little um, polishing, you can get an 80%. Uh, and uh, if you did not do... I'm sorry, you can get a 90%. And if you did not do all, but you did turn it in on time, we're going to give you an 80%. Now, for those, and, and I'm going to count on time, not just for yesterday, for tonight. If you can get yours in by tonight, we, you still can fall in that 100%, 90%, 80%. 80%. And uh, if you um, get yours in by next Friday, then you can fall under the 90%, 80%, 70%. A lot of grace in that, isn't it? Uh, Sister Prelo, your hands up. Yes, sir. Um, I was having a little bit of problems uploading. It, um, I, I don't, I, you know, that's ever since uh, last week. I told you I, I'd done it, but I just, um, I don't know how to upload it in the Google section. It it would come up in the box, right? But it would not stay. I kept having to click the X and going back out. I tried it um, different ways, but, you know, I don't know how to upload it. Well, well Do Dr. Kinley is my uh, technologist. Um, can you help her? Can you uh, offer uh, suggestions to her? Or is there a way we can uh, mediate this situation? Dr. Kinley? Yes, certainly. Um, 
are you using PowerPoint or do you have a Yahoo account or what? Yeah, I I used um I used the PowerPoint. Okay, I do have a Yahoo. Your your email address is Yahoo. Yes. Okay, that might be the issue because the file might be too large to upload. Um, do you by chance have a Gmail account? I do. Okay, utilize that Gmail account and then upload from that perspective. Uh, because sometimes Yahoo uh, won't allow you to upload large files, but Gmail will. So that's probably the technical difficulty that you're having. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Amen. Anyone else with those kind of technical issues? Um, Bromel, Brother Bromel. Um, my question is, I, I think mine was uploaded, but... How can we make sure that it's had that it has been received? I can go online and verify, but um, Dr. Kingley, can you handle his question? He's my go-to man. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> once it's uploaded um, and it has sent, we will automatically get an email of uh, instructor that is uh, that will uh, let us know that the uh, PowerPoint has been submitted. Um, and then, of course, we can send a confirm uh, message that we have received it, um, just to let you know that we have gotten it. Okay, because I um I sent mine, and it's it, it's showing that it has been sent, but I didn't get anything, you know, confirming that it had been received. Mm -hmm. But um, because I sent it maybe like three, four nights ago, four days ago, but I didn't see anything. So I was just making sure that it was. Right. We're going to be grading the first group tonight. That's why we gave the deadline as tonight. And um, once you're graded, you're going to get your grade right back. And so you should see something when you wake up in the morning. And then the second group we're going to do on the weekend. So Friday. And let me just say, it will time stamp you. Um, someone turned one in 1230 last night and it said 30 minutes late. So it will time stamp you. Uh, so, uh, Bear that in mind. We're not trying to cause any pain or discomfort. We're trying to prepare you for ministry. You know, you can't walk into the pulpit and say, I didn't quite finish that sermon. Uh, can I get an extension? <laughs> do, do you think they're going to give you one? The, the church going to give you? Well, I didn't have time. I didn't quite finish it. Can I get an extension? You know, uh, and I'm going to say there have been pastors who walked in the pulpit unprepared. Um, you might get away with that once or twice, but you can't pastor a church and do that because they see you every week and they know when you aren't prepared. Oh, I see a head wagging, yeah, uh, nodding and approving. They know when you're not prepared. Oh, Reverend didn't prepare today. Oh, they'll say, that's that same sermon he preached three weeks ago. He just changed something. Um, the great Dr. Floyd Flake, uh, I had a conversation with him and we were talking, you know, Jamaica, New York, that gigantic Allen Temple. How'd you do that? And he said, I always gave them fresh food. I never served them leftovers. Amen. I'm going to say a little bit about ministry and then we're going to go into the work. Um, you might Dr. feel Blythe. some tension in the meetings, uh, especially on the state level. Um, we are losing something in ministry. Uh, there's a saying in the Dr. military, and uh, this is for the military. This wasn't for God. This is for the military. And many times when you would be out there working out, you PTN, you know, you. I, I was stationed with the, I was a, a, with the Navy, but often stationed with the Marines. I got to wear Marine green. So you're out there running with the Marines, your dog tired. Uh, and just when you don't think you have any more left, they say, hey, Marine. All it takes is all you got. All it takes is all you got. Let me just say something. All it takes is all you got. And if you don't bring it all, you really won't fit into the ministry. The ministry is not a part-time hustle. It's not something we do on the side. It is our lives. It's our lives. Uh, I have left jobs. I've left locations. 
I didn't plan this, but someone was asking me, you said, where you live? I said, I live in Bluffton. That's where my church is. They said, I thought you were from something. Yeah, I have a house in something too. But didn't you used to live in Dillon? Yeah, I used to live in Dillon. Everywhere the church called me, I had to pick up my family and move. It was, it's my life. And when I was in the military, they didn't have a problem moving me overnight. You get a set of orders saying, leave in the morning. It is our life. It's not a job. It's not a hustle. And we were preparing you for that. And you might've heard the, the state dean say, you know, it's not the second thing in your life. It's not that I, I'm doing, um, I'm a whatever you do. I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a business person. I work at the bank and I pastor. Is that I pastor. That's what I do. Oh yeah, there may be another little thing over there, but I pastor or I am a minister. And so we want you to own that and that's why we are a little tight. We're not trying to um, be mean. We're trying to prepare you for that, uh, for a ministry that's going to ask for your life. Jesus said that, didn't he? He said, you got to lose your life. If you try to keep it, you're going to lose it. But when you give that thing up and say, Lord, this is yours, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, whoever you want me to be, I'm all in, you keep your life. Amen. All right. We're going to pull Dr. up the first Dr. lecture. Blight. Yes, go ahead. Dr. Blight, uh, I just want to know what I'm in the right place. I was saying um, in this class. You can attend this class. As a member of the South Carolina Board of Examiners, we're giving you freedom to attend any of the <laughs> classes that you would like. Oh, okay. Thank you. That is the Reverend Dr. Henry Borbor. Amen. Can you Amen. all see the screen? Okay. We're going to start. I'm assuming you've already read the material. I am going to go through a lot of the material quickly, but for the class participation, we're going to start with just a few icebreakers, just a few icebreakers. And um, Dr. Kinley, once I go into this mode, I can't see who's all there. So you're gonna to have to help me with uh, who's in the room, but I wanna call first on, and if I called on you uh, last week, um, let me know so I, I can make an adjustment. Um, Melva Streeter, pick one of these icebreakers and tell us which story you wanna share with us. Either your uh, call you to ministry, a brief, a recent miracle story or a lesson from a mentor. Be brief. This is your elevator speech. Okay, I did one last week. Do you want me to do another one? We're gonna pass on you. Your name sure. is. I think um, <laughs> Brother Thaddeus did one last week. Bonita Scott, Madden. Yes, sir. Pick one. Mm, I will. Choose number three, <clears throat> okay. a lesson from a mentor. Um, this lesson uh, was probably a couple of weeks ago. Um, something that will, and it kind of piggybacks off of what you just said, um, was talking to a minister and she was talking about um, other things that I do. Um, for instance, like singing <clears throat> and and her lesson was not to get boxed in to how people perceive you or what they perceive you to be. And in essence, she was saying, um, I, I preached at her church and, and she was telling the congregation who I was. And it was like, who? And she was like, you know, the one from Papa Spring that sings. And it was like, oh, yeah, her. And, and so that woke up something in me because I don't want to be classified as a singer that that will preach I, I am a preacher that happens to sing so her lesson was don't get boxed in to how they perceive you know who you are and express that and and that that made a huge huge difference uh for me and i'm appreciative appreciative of that word excellent excellent uh faith story Sister Denise Johnson, pick either number one or number two, because number three has been taken. 
Okay, good evening. Um, I will choose. Um, I would choose number one. Um, my call to ministry, I have been called from a small child. Um, I started out singing and um, I ran from my call a very long time. I was not ready. Um, you know, sometimes we feel, you know, when we're young, we're saying, you know, I still got more life in me to live. I don't want to, you know, answer my call and mess up. Um, but um my call really hit when my mother died five years ago. And um, I noticed that I was using her as a crutch from running from my call. And when she died, I answered my call. And so sometimes in that story, sometimes God has to take the very thing that you're holding on to, to get your full undivided attention. And so I tell God, thank you. Anyhow. <laughs> A, a, a wonderful story. A lot of call stories are connected to those times. Remember what Isaiah said in the year that Uzziah, Uzziah died? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw the Lord. Mm -hmm. Brother Harrington Ford, you only have one left, number two. Um, good evening, everyone. Coincidentally, we were in service a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of the members uh, began to just go extremely faint, like they went lifeless. Um, immediately, I was thankful that I'm in a church where people would know to immediately start praying and steady, you know, everybody crowded. Um, and she went from being lifeless to at least aware that there were people around her uh, trying to get her back. Fast forward a week after that, she came back and she testified that they, when the ambulance came, when they put her in the ambulance, they told her she had actually suffered a mild heart attack. Hmm. Um, but she was back in church a week later because she said that the prayer of the prayers of the righteous had availed, and what could have been a very uh, catastrophic event ended up being an opportunity for God to unveil His power in front of those who may not have believed that he still is in the healing business. So I thank God that we were a part of that. Wow, that's a wonderful uh, recent miracle story. We thank you three for the icebreakers and we'll, uh, well, actually next week you're gonna have Dr. Kinley and he'll do whatever he chooses to do. So I'm not gonna pro program him. Uh, I'm assuming that everybody read the materials. And so this is that class participation and we're just gonna start calling on some people to um, answer some of our questions. And we're gonna start with Sister Williams and um, answer the question of where was um, Bishop Payne born? Where was he born? In uh, Charleston, South Carolina. What? In Charleston? Amen. He, and that's important. <laughs> a matter of fact, everyone should know that. He was born in Charleston. What seminary did he attend? Sister Marilyn Lee, what seminary did Bishop Payne attend? You're on mute. Yes, sir. I don't have that answer because I was basically trying to read liberation and theology. I didn't even have a chance to look at that. So I'm just being totally honest. I, I hear you. I hear you. Thank you for that honesty. I appreciate that. Thaddeus Smith, what seminary did uh, Bishop Payne attend? He attended Gettysburg Seminary. Right. He attended Gettysburg Seminary. Excellent. 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 Uh, Sandy Gillison. Um, list just one accomplishment or achievement of Bishop Payne. Brother Gillison, you're on mute. Um, found at Wilford College. Oh, man, you got it. Uh, you got it. You got it. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, we're giving... Um, Sister Jacobs, a pass this week. That's the past. Uh, the the teacher is doing that. 
Um, so we're going to give her a pass. And I'm looking through the group. Did I miss anyone in the room? Has everyone in the room said something? Oh, I haven't. Who, who's speaking? Uh, my century, I'm Jimmy Brumel. Oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Um, I need you to tell me what annual conference did Bishop Payne form? And I think you were the one we had a, the name mix up. Thank you, sir. What yes. annual conference did Bishop Payne form? He established which annual conference? Um, uh, one. Uh, one guess. Take a good guess. You might get it. I'm going to give you a clue. And it may not help you. I'm in that annual conference. <laughs> so you know it's in the state of South Carolina. You got a yes, one in six yes. chance of getting it. Uh um. It is the August. mother conference of the AME Church south of the Mason Dixon line. Mother Conference for the State of South Carolina. Anyone want to help him? What is the South Carolina Annual Conference? Annual Conference. Oh, that's it. That's the it. That's mother it. Conference. The Mother <laughs> Conference of the Lord's Church. The <laughs> South Carolina Annual Conference. Amen. <laughs> Did I miss anyone else in Karen. the room? I have several names, but I think most of them are not in the room. Did I miss anyone like in the room? Question. Go ahead. Who is that? Y'all better say that loud. <laughs> Amen. Did I miss anyone in the room? I'm going to tell you what I tell my congregation on Sunday sometimes. Buckle your seatbelts. We're going through the next section very fast, very fast, because we hope and pray that you have done your work. And so um, the PowerPoint, someone texted me and uh, during the week there were some issues with the PowerPoint. I replaced the PowerPoints with PDFs. So everyone should be able to download. And this PowerPoint is already in your Google Classroom. You can use your PDF to download it. It will not have the videos. It will not have the videos. But other than that, you can get it. And so tighten up your seat belts. Here we go. Let's see. Ah. This is just uh, all that information on pain. I'm not going to go over it. Some of that you've already heard, but here's the video on pain. Dr. Black, before you go further, um, Brother Bromel, did you have your hand up? Yes. Um, I want to say um, about the, the PDF that you just mentioned, I didn't, I did not get it. That's why I'm a little lost with um with the lesson. I didn't see it. I went to um I went and I looked for anything that needed to be downloaded or anything, but I didn't see it. You, you, um, you're in Google Classroom yes. for the day's date. And right. say I went there, but either I, I, I either I didn't know, figure out how to download it, but I did go there, but I didn't see it where I could have downloaded any information. I'm going to try something. So this might work. I'm going to see, can we, I share Google Classroom with you. Okay. It might, it might let me do this. I don't know. It might be cannibalizing the program. Mr. Bromel, uh, Brother Bromel, it's, you are on the uh, classroom. I think what it is, is that uh, once you click on the icon, you just need to play, uh, press the section where it says download or download all, and you'll be able to download to your device. Um, okay. and, and that's probably the step that you're missing. Um, okay. When you click the button that says download, download all, you'll be able to access it. You just can't. Okay. I, I, did, I, I did not do that. That's probably why I didn't do that. And I, I do have it on the, can you see the screen? So you see where we yeah. are. This is the PowerPoint yes, lecture right here. Yes, sir. Okay. 
now let's see can we go back to um and while and while dr black is still uh transitioning um for those of you who have uh, submitted your powerpoint or your homework assignment i have responded uh, to your PowerPoint and to your paper to let you know that we have received it. And for those of you who have not uh, turned it in, I did send an email that you are still missing. And so we talked about the grace. Um, so uh, we ask that you get those in as soon as possible. Thank you, Dr. Black. Okay. Dr. Black, may I add one or two things here? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, initially, the few questions was raised since we are studying for the students. I would suggest whenever you ask answer the question, make sure you define your words such so like miracles. If the miracle, what is miracles? I mean, I don't know. You define it first before you address the question, because without the definitions of the you. you you it make the reader uh, uncomfortable to know what you're talking about. So whatever terminology you used in answering your questions, make sure you define it. We thank Dr. Bobo for that. Amen. Here's our video. <laughs> Can we hear and see? historian, lecturer, and adjunct professor of history at Charleston Southern University in Charleston, South Carolina. You know, it's a common thing in my classes when I start talking about African American history, especially when I start talking about people such as uh, the great Frederick Douglass and David Walker and Denmark Vesey and other of these great literate African Americans during the slave period. Inevitably, one of my students will tell me, Gee, Mr. Fordham, I didn't know they had black people that were educated in slavery days. You know, perhaps I shouldn't be surprised about that, because unfortunately, most people get their history from movies and television, and even worse, a lot of garbage that uninformed people put out on uh, social media, and I hate to say it, in many cases, YouTube too. You always got to check people's sources before you uh, believe these type of things. But anyway, with that being said, I often have to correct them that yes, you did have a lot of educated black people, even during the slave era. In fact, I'm about to tell you about one of them now. One of them was a teacher during the slave era by the name of Daniel Alexander Payne. He was born in Charleston, South Carolina on February the 24th, 1811 to London and Martha Payne. Both of them were free blacks who were racially mixed. But his parents died young. But he still managed to learn to love reading and knowledge at an early age. There was a free black man by the name of Thomas Bono uh, who established a school. And he learned from that, but after he got the fundamentals of reading and writing, he went on to teach himself to master such subjects as Greek, Latin, mathematics, science, and classical literature. He was especially proud of learning Hebrew, ancient Greek on his own, so that he could read the Bible in its original languages. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in ancient Greek. Anyway, when Payne joined the Methodist Church at the age of 15, he said he heard the voice of God calling him, saying, I have set thee apart to educate thyself, in order that thou mayest be an educator to thy people. So Payne would spend the rest of his life obeying that injunction. He described his early efforts in his autobiography entitled Reflections on Seventy Years. He said, My first school was opened in 1829 on a house in Trad Street, which is in downtown Charleston, occupied by one Caesar Wright, and consisted of his three children, for each of whom he paid 50, 50 cents a month. I also taught three adult slaves at night. This was not efficient to, slave, to feed me. But the slave woman by the name of Eleanor Parker supplied many of my wants. I was happy in my humble employment, but at the end of the year, I was so discouraged by the financial result 
and by the remarks expressed by envious persons, note, by the remarks of envious persons, that I decided to seek some other employment which would yield better pay. However, he had an encounter with a slaveholder after considering this idea. And he was conversing with the slaveholder. And the slaveholder said, said, Payne, do you know the difference between the master and his slave? And Daniel Alexander Payne said he wasn't sure. And the slave holder replied, get this, nothing but superior knowledge. Think about that. The difference between a slave and a free man, he said, was nothing but superior knowledge. And that reminded That's Daniel good. Alexander Payne of his duty to educate his brethren regardless of the low pay and the jealousy of other people. And he reopened his school. The second school expanded to a larger building that contained 60 students among the enslaved as well as free black children as well as adults. However, by 1835, the school was in jeopardy. You see, back in the 1820s and 1830s, you had these literate free and enslaved rebels such as Nat Turner and David Walker and Charleston's own Denmark Vesey. And they used biblical verses and newspaper stories about slave rebellions in Haiti and other places to encourage their slave, belt rebel their slave brethren to revolt against slavery. And since these rebels used written materials and their ability to read and write to encourage these slave rebellions, the South Carolina legislature that year passed a law prohibiting the teachings of African Americans, free or slave, to read or write. So Payne was forced to close his school. But he moved to Philadelphia, where he rose in the ranks of the newly established African, Meth African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AMEs, which was also outlawed in Charleston after the Denmark Vesey Rebellion. So he became a bishop in the AME church. He never forgot his conversation with the slave older and promoted education as a means of, a, a means of freedom for his people. And that occasionally caused controversy because he was opposed to allowing illiterate preachers and the emotionless, un unstructured style of religion that was popular among Southern blacks. In other words, he didn't go for all of that. Well, I woke up this morning, ha, and I was a feeling bad, ha, and now I know Jesus, ha, and now I was glad, and all that kind of thing. You know, he wanted preachers who could educate the people as well as excite their emotions. So he brought order and structure to the many of the AME churches, but that led to conflict with supporters of the old way of doing things. But he didn't let that stop him. He was one of the founders and the first president of Wilberforce University in Ohio, one of the first black colleges. And it was the first black college that actually was founded mostly by African Americans themselves, and it's still going on. He would also visit jails in many cities to minister to black prisoners. Now, while he felt that education was the key to freedom, he also understood that other means were necessary. In 1882, he was on a train to a church conference in Jacksonville, Florida, and the conductor attempted to force Bishop Payne into a railroad car for colored passengers. And Bishop Payne replied, I will not dishonor my manhood by going into that car. You stop your train and put me off. Well, the conductor did just that. And so Payne walked toward Jacksonville until some black men gave him a ride about a mile outside of the city. Protests were made to the authorities, and a newspaper editor and a district attorney refused to take Payne's case. But the editor and the district attorney both died of natural causes shortly afterward. And Bishop Daniel Alexander Payne was given complimentary tickets for future use on that train. So he died in 1893 at the age of 82. And I want you to think about this. A lot of you right now are teaching school, probably under very rough conditions with uh, poor conditions, unruly students, parents who won't cooperate, you know, wanting to come to school and fight the teacher and all of that. And sometimes you have to spend money out of your own pockets to educate these young people. Now, I just want you to think about this. With the difficulties that you face today, imagine what people like Bishop Daniel Alexander Payne went through to educate people at a time when it was far, far worse. And he went on to help start a college that exists today and create a legacy for the African American Episcopal Church as well for the United States of America. So while you think you have it bad, think of how you have it.
think of how he had it then and what you can do with your advantages today. This is Damon Porter. Mm, that's a good one. Okay, okay. We're going to stop a minute. Any reflections? Tell me something that you saw in the video that you did not know prior. Give me your name too so I can check you off on the class participation list. So we knew all that, Sarah, right? It was Sister Marilyn Lee. Just yes, hearing so much about um, Bishop Payne and how he would not allow illiterate preachers. He preferred preachers to be educated. You know, and that's something that's going on still today. Um, that we that they encourage us to be educated so we'll be better prepared to serve God's people. Also, just listening to the challenges, like he said, in the end that we are going through now doesn't even compare to what they go they went through. And that's why I believe it's taken so serious as we should as African Americans to educate ourselves and to be prepared to serve God's people. It was, it was an awesome video. I just saw Sister uh, Kouye on the line. Did we call on you today? I don't think we did. Could you tell us uh, a reflection on the I'm video? Sorry. I'll give a reflection. Um, I enjoyed um, the quote that he said when, and I'm quoting him when he said that um, the difference between the free man and the bound man or the man who's a slave is knowledge. And I think that is still applicable today, um, not just regarding religion, but in various areas of our lives. And I feel that um, if we as people, if we take time to get knowledge, it will help us out in all areas. And I still feel, even to this day, that it is the job of the preacher to educate not only the church, but also the community around them, um, to make sure that we are educated where we can live better lives. Um, I know when we pray the All Father's Prayer, and I'm just venturing off, I'll come back home. <laughs> but when we pray the prayer, we said that kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants his will to come to earth. And if we take the time to get knowledge, we can help manifest his will on the earth. So um, not to be too long, but I thank God for the lecture. I thank him for the class. I thank him for you all and the assembly to get knowledge, as knowledge is power. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, Brother Ford, is your hand up or is that old? Yeah. You're yes, muted. yeah, my hand is well. Uh, I just, since Kouye beat me actually to it, I was going to say the exact same thing. Uh, once upon a time, the church was the pillar of the community for if those who didn't have need it. Um, I think a lot of times, especially in this society, I think we do a very good job of churching inside of church, but we don't do a great job of providing uh, what the community needs. A lot of our kids are dealing with stuff, in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion, because in my mind, the church is absent. Uh, we're too busy uh, wanting to spread uh, Bible verses, but we don't want to teach how to live, teach how to maintain finances, teach how to maintain uh, integrity. Uh, I think if we use the education that God gives us to do something other than uh, give us a rendition, your rendition of Matthew, uh, interpretation of uh, Jesus' life, I think we can have a greater impact on this world and I think that's what uh, Bishop Payne really intended from the beginning. Amen. I I'm going to give three, the order for the next three people. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Nolan to wait to the next video because he's going to be the first to talk on the next video. So we're going to go with um, Sister Streeter, Brother Bromel, and then uh, Sister Prelo in that order. Um, I just wanted to say it kind of hit home for me because what he was saying at the end when he talked about educators in the classroom and all the things that we go through and literally I'm I'm in the classroom and I literally drove home crying today because it was just that kind of day. But when he was talking about you think that was bad, just imagine what he went through and it kind of just kind of brought things home for me. I just think that's God confirming, you know, that 
just like you were saying, this this comes first. And that his struggle to make sure that even today, what we need to know was was way worse than any little thing that we experienced daily. Amen. You all got it. You got it. Brother Bromo? Uh, what I wanted to say, what caught my attention was, you know, we always speak about Miss um, uh, Rosa Parks and the bus. They wanted her to sit on the front seat because of her color. And he spoke about the train where they actually put him off because, <laughs> you know, he, he because of what he didn't want to do. And as we as I look at it, we can relate, you know, past history. What went on then was probably worse than what they went through then, you know, during her time. And it's sad to to think about, you know, what that that the um the road had had not sad, but it's good to know that the road had been paved, started being paved way before this time. And some of those stuff, like what he did, is not being taught. You know, I think this is something that needs to be teached to children and in church school or whatever to know where it really, really started from. And that really caught my attention when he said that. Hmm. You all are getting it. This is excellent. Sister Prelo. Yes. Um, you know, the, the, the big thing for me is that the history. Um, we are piggybacking and we are where we are because of a lot of our um, sisters and brothers that went through something. And at the very end um, in the video, when he was talking about, you know, if we think that uh, we have it bad, think about what he had gone through. And it just reminds me also just the fact that, you know, we don't, as I said before, we don't uh, really have uh, enough education um, on our history. And in order to know where you're going, you have to realize where you came from, and and that 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 includes uh, you know the biblical. It, it's it's really really imperative that we have some Christian education, whereas we teach uh, you know where where our folks, where our ancestors, where people came from, what they had to go through. When you look at uh, the the ethnicity, even with um, you know, like with Jesus and and coming from the territory, you know, he came in, and then we look at what people put out the their story of their their perception of that picture that we see. Uh, yeah, we I do believe that we need to do some research, and and it just showed ignor ignorance when he said when the people ask him. Well, I didn't believe, um, you know, slaves were educated back in that time. We were always educated. We were always there. We 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 have come a long way. And uh, Jay, it is what it is. That's why people feared us in the beginning. And still do. Amen. Yes. We're going to do Henry McNeil Turner next. And um, Brother Nolan will be the first speaker after this. Uh, let me see, can I pull him, pull the PowerPoint back up? Okay. And if I do this right, let's see. Okay, you got these points. I'm not going to go over these points with you. You have them. Um, I, I do want you to look at this one. This last slide deals with um, Henry McNeil's work with the uh, Liberia. But here's his video. Henry McNeil Turner was born February the 1st, 1834, in Newberry Courthouse, South Carolina. While Turner was young, his father passed, and as the firstborn child, he was left to be the man of the house. As an adolescent, Turner worked in cotton fields alongside enslaved people and held a job as a blacksmith. However, he had envisioned himself as a minister and began to teach himself to read with help from people within the community. By the time he was 15, Turner had read the entire Bible five times and had trained himself to memorize lengthy passages of scripture. 
He attended revival services with his mother and would later join the Methodist Church in Abbeville, South Carolina. At the age of 19, he became a licensed preacher and traveled throughout the South preaching to integrated audiences. In 1856, he married Eliza Peacher, the daughter of a wealthy African-American house builder in Columbia, South Carolina. In 1858, he joined the African Methodist Episcopal Church and was assigned to the AME mission in Baltimore, Maryland. While there, he attended Trinity College and gained his first form of formal education. Turner studied Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and theologian. And in 1862, he became an ordained minister and took the role as pastor of the Union Bethel Church in Washington, D.C. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln commissioned Turner to the office of chaplain in the Union Army, making him the first black chaplain in any branch of military. In this capacity, he also became a war correspondent writing many articles for the Christian Recorder newspaper about the trials and tribulations of the 1st Regiment U.S. Colored Troops. When the Civil War ended, he found himself assigned to the Freedmen's Bureau in Georgia as Army Chaplain. However, Turner soon resigned from his chaplaincy mainly because of prejudice and racism. After leaving the military, Turner turned his attention to politics during the period of Reconstruction and while working with the Freedmen Bureau, Turner became a Republican Party organizer and helped recruit and organize black voters throughout Georgia. He helped establish the first Republican state convention and assisted in drafting a new Georgia state constitution. He was later elected to the Georgia state legislature. However, any excitement that Turner, or black people in general, had for ushering in a new day after the Civil War disappeared quickly when white members of the state legislature voted to disqualify blacks from holding elected office. After Turner's removal from the Georgia state legislature, Turner became United States Postmaster in Macon, Georgia, the first black to ever hold that position. He also held the position as Customs Inspector in Savannah, Georgia, which he held for several years. Eventually, he resigned due to increasing demands of the church. After his resignation, Turner focused his efforts on building the AME Church in the South, and by 1876, he became publications manager for the AME Church. This allowed him to travel to all districts and meet the pastors and leaders of local churches. During the four years he served as publications manager, he developed a following that led to his election as one of the bishops of the church. As bishop, Turner had a national platform on which to support his ideas on race, politics, lynchings, and other issues of the day. However, as racism became more of an issue for blacks, Turner increasingly became a proponent of the Back to Africa movement. During the first decade of the 20th century, he edited two newspapers, the voice of missions and the voice of the people. He also served as chair of the board for Morris Brown College from 1896 to 1908 and kept a busy schedule up until the end of his life. Henry McNeil Turner's life was guided by faith. He was a minister, politician, and bishop of the AME Church and is seen as one of the most influential African Americans in the late 19th century. Okay, Brother Christopher, what are your reflections on Henry McNeil Turner? Yes, sir. Um, first thing that caught my attention was how, self, how he was able to, to teach himself various things. And that's very important as, as educators is for us to be, as much as we try to educate other people, it's very important for us to educate ourselves. Because how are we supposed to educate other people? We don't know for ourselves exactly what we want to educate other pe people on. And also another fact that he he never settled. He was jumping from various positions, various appointments, because he wanted, he wanted more. He wanted more if he wasn't satisfied with something or if he saw that there was no change coming. He, was, he wanted to jump to the next thing because he knew that this is not what I want. And also, 
if I want to create change, I can't create, I cannot create it here. I will create it somewhere else. So always being willing and open to new ideas, new opportunities for his ministry to grow. Well, that opens the door for a slide. He's nailing it. Let me let me pull this slide up if I can. Let's see if it works. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, Henry McNeil Turner was a close associate with Abraham Lincoln. He became the first black chaplain under Abraham Lincoln, but he was actually uh, given a full commission on anybody, the last person anyone would expect uh, under Andrew Jackson. Um, but he, uh, Andrew Johnson, but he was made a chaplain by Lincoln. Both Lincoln and Henry McNeil Turner felt that African Americans would not get a fair shake in the United States of America. And so they looked for other alternatives, including Haiti, uh, one that I wish they had taken, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, that would have been a nice place to put us, New Mexico and Arizona. They even looked in South America. Uh, Henry McNeil Turner did help settle Liberia. And so this is what we have from uh, the notes. During the last four years, last four decades of his life, Turner became a vocal supporter of immigration for African-Americans. He personally attended the sailing of the ship Azor from Charleston to Liberia, and the date is there, with 200 immigrants aboard. In 1984, sorry, 1894, Turner helped organize the international Migration Society, which raised funds to charter two vessels for immigration. Um, the ship Hosa departed from Liberia, departed for Liberia on March the 19th, 1895. And, uh, and the ship Larida left on March 2nd, carrying a total of 500 individuals. Um, you might notice something. We have a lot, not a lot. We have a good number of pastors from Liberia right here in South Carolina. It's not an accident. It's not an accident. It's from the work of Henry McNeil Turner. And he might have been ahead of his time. He realized that it would be very difficult for African Americans, even with freedom, to be treated humanely in this country. Sister Prelo, your hands up. I'm sorry that I meant to take it back down. Huh? Okay. Anyone else want to reflect on Henry McNeil Turner? Let me just say a couple other things because you, you're, going, you're going to get an exam. The exam is going to have 50 questions. 25 are going to come from these first two weeks. And one question might be something to do with the Empire State of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Do anyone know what is the Empire State of the African Methodist Episcopal Church? Empire State. It was in the reading, but you probably, right, my, it's important because when you start traveling the church and you go to that state, they're going to tell you who they are. Not black. Who's calling? Mark, Mark Lamore here. Yes, sir. I, 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 I because uh, Henry McNeil Turner was, um, as I understand, born in uh, Abbeville in the upstate, uh, I seem to gravitate with uh, my uh, decades of ministry uh, to his. Uh, fervor and fire uh, to, to, to some extent in the preaching, but... Now, Dr. McLemore, you going to answer the question on the floor? No, no I, I'm not going to deal with the empire. Well, well if the question on the floor is in order. The oh, question okay. on the floor is in order. and Because this is an exam just... question, and I don't want you to steal that exam question from my candidates. No, I'm Where not that you're in it. after the question on the floor is answered. Anyone with a guess on what is the granite state? Y'all should I have a guess now. Y'all hadn't Googled it by now? I have a guess. This is licensed you're at Kuye speaking. Yes. Cool. Okay. I would like to say in New York. That would sound like it because of the Empire State Building. It is Georgia. 
And that is wow. where Henry McNeil Turner was the presiding elder for a long time. He was a tremendous, most presiding elders are uh, happy to hold on to what they have. He grew the church right in, right, I'm in Bluffton, right across the line from me in, in Savannah. That man did a tremendous job. Now, um, Reverend McElmore, we're gonna give you one minute. You got your floor. I, I was trying to respond to the, anyone wanting to add a little extra about Henry McNeil Turner. Uh, I'm so impressed that he is uh, one of the four horsemen. And of course, uh, his zeal was the kind of thing that uh, the church and his uh, polity that he created is uh, one of the most powerful things about uh, our church uh, in action today. And I'll be quiet after that. He said a mouthful. Henry McNeil Turner, as you read, uh, was in charge of all the publications of the Amy Church. And he developed, I'm sure it's on my bookshelf if I look hard. He did, yes. This is Henry McNeil Turner. Turner's Polity. And if you don't have this in your library, you need to get it in there. You need to get it in there. Turner's Polity. Uh, you've got to have that in your library as an AME. All right, uh, we're going to move on. And and uh, I'm I'm assuming that you've already done your work. I'm just this is just overview and and making sure that you focus on the things that you need to focus on. So that's Henry McNeil Turner. We saw the video. Um, these are significant events in the Amy Church. I'm just going to outline them real quick. Um, they're in your reading. We start with the walkout of Old St. George, 1887, the formation of the Free African Society, 1887, the yellow fever epidemic. I'm sorry, I'm saying 18, 1787, 1787, 1793. Um, the next big issue you see is 1948, right in South Carolina. Uh, Reverend J.A. Delane, right at Liberty Hill, which is in Manning, South Carolina. Uh, he brought a lawsuit, Briggs versus Clarendon County School Board. That would become a part of the 1953 Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court case. And Delaney, you, the reading is wonderful. Read what is in the text. Uh, he became a fugitive because of his work as a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, they could target and bully the people who worked jobs. You know, several people got laid off because of this lawsuit, but Delaney worked for the Lord. They couldn't lay him off. So they tried to kill him. He was actually had several attempts on his life. One, one is mentioned in the text and uh, it would go on later to produce um, the great, uh, case that went before the Supreme Court, Brown versus the Board of Education in 1953. In 1949, Joanne Robinson is the precursor of the Montgomery boycott. She was pulled off her seat in Montgomery, um, tried to organize, wasn't able to do something immediately, but she didn't stop. She continued to work, continued to work until December 1st, 1955, when Rosa Parks sits on that bus and refused to give up her seat. And if you read the text, you notice that it said the same bus driver that pulled her off the bus that day, or tried to pull her off the bus that day, got her arrested, had done that 10 years earlier. It's a matter of timing. The next date you see in the um, reading would be September 23rd, 1957, the Little Rock Nine. March 7th is not in your reading. Uh, 1965, Bloody Sunday, um, John Lewis, Brown Chapel, Edmund Pettus Bridge. That's a story we can't get over. Uh, even now, um, we correspond, um, my church, when um, the recently uh, Brown Chapel had a tornado and uh, we sent them a check. We sent them a check. Um, they're a big part of us. 1992 is not in your reading. Cecil Murray just died, I think April 6th, uh, right around that time. Pastor First Amy. He was a gentleman in the LA riots that settled the confusion between the black and Hispanic com community um, and said, you know, we're all on the same side here. 
And then 2008, the AME Church um, was a big part of the election of Barack Obama. Okay, um, just a second. I'm trying to access, someone's trying to talk. Let's see. Okay, well, I'm gonna move on and um, just looking at our time to try to get us through and talk about liberation theology in a different way than you're gonna get it um, next week. So these are free, this is not in your reading, um, this is free. Part of the issue between what's happening in our world today between the black arm of the church and the white arm of the church is the fact that uh, the history of the white arm of the church included slavery. Any church that has the name Southern in it divided over slavery, Southern Baptist divided over slavery. Okay, let's see, can we pull out? Southern Baptist divided over slavery. Southern Methodist divided over slavery. And so the chart I gave you is the tulip chart, which is a part of the reform um, tradition of the church. And I'm gonna walk through that tulip chart and show you the difference between where we as a liberation church are. Now, let me just say there are a lot of black reformers. I went to Princeton. My first seminary that I went to was Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, which is Northwestern Seminary, which is where James Cone came from. Garrett is 99% white. I learned more about being a black man on Garrett's campus than any other school. I have five earned degrees, four different institutions, and I learned more about being a black man on an almost all white campus. That's where James Cone discovered black theology that campus. Um, I also went to Princeton. Princeton is the birthplace for fundamentalism. Hodge, Hodge, some of you probably got Hodge book on your shelf. Hodge is systematic theology. I took it. Hodge, Princeton. And its uh, primary purpose was to sustain slavery. If you go back and you look at um, the writings of Frederick Douglass and the writings of other people, Benjamin Banneker, read his writings. Uh, the church was going through a decision. Uh, there were those who says the Bible taught against slavery and those who said, no, the Bible never condemned slavery. The group that said the Bible taught against slavery was criticized as being um, a spiritualizing the Bible, saying things like, what would Jesus do? Uh, Matthew 25 is one of the organizing scriptures of the Bible. And the other group chose to do something that sounds so good. They went into the verbal, plenary, inspired, inerrant, inspired word of God. They raised scripture to a high, high level, so it seemed. And in doing that, they got rid of anybody who would interpret scripture in what they call a spiritualizing way. Anybody who would say, that's not consistent with the life of Jesus, they would say, but wait a minute. None of the scriptures say thou shall not have a slave. They do, but they didn't read those scriptures. They do say thou shall not have a slave. Uh, many of the Bible people had slaves. Many um, of the scriptures from Paul support slavery. So we can't go again. But if you look at the those who were called the spiritualist um, interpretation of it, and starting with things like, uh, our summary of the Decalogue and Matthew 25, you get a completely different religion. In Matthew 25, where is Jesus found? He's found with the least of these. He's found with everybody society doesn't like, those who are in prison, those with leprosy, those who are sick, th those who are, are orphans and, and widows. That's where Jesus is. And that's the opposite of what they were bringing to pass. They didn't want to go into that because then who would be the disinherited or disenfranchised? Slaves, enslaved people. And they didn't want enslaved people to be the center of God's focus. So uh, in the other part, Matthew, I mean, the um, our summary of the Decalogue, the heart of the Bible, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. So they got rid of that to go with this. Uh, and, and a lot of us have that. I grew up with that kind of higher critical 
um, understanding of scripture, a, a kind of liberal, a literalism with that comes into there and a fundamentalism and, you know, a rigid understanding of the word. I grew up in it, all that. All that was done to support slavery. It's like getting to the end of the road and looking up and said, oh no, it's the wrong road. So let me see, can I walk through reform? Uh, it's telling me it's not sharing my screen. Can you see it now? I can see it. Okay. Let's see, can yes, we sir. open it up a little bit? Okay. Um, so the heart of reform theology is tulip. And and I I I have some wonderful AMEs who probably mad with me for teaching this right now, but the heart of reform to theology is tulip. And the tulip formula, is, uh, each of the letters in tulip has meaning. It's not letting me advance. So the T stands for total depravity. John Calvin taught that every person comes into this world with total depravity. We are Armenian. We say that there's a divine spark. A matter of fact, we said everyone is made in the image of God. We have a treasure in a clay pot. The reason we baptize babies is because they're in the state of innocency. Innocency. And uh, let me say this. Uh, we need to own that. When you get ordained, one of the prayers that will be prayed over you is for you to return to your state of innocency. So we don't believe that everybody born into the world is depraved. We say, yeah, they're sinners. They got a clay pot, but they also are made in the image of God. So we don't buy total depravity. The second one is unconditional election. Calvin believed in the sovereignty of God and God elected who God would elect and we had nothing to do with it. And he elected some to go to heaven and he elected some to go to hell. Had nothing to do with the individual. That's God's business. To unconditional election. We believe God elects according to foreknowledge. God knows what's in us. God knows what decisions we'll make. God knows what world we'll live in. And he gives all of us the potential to choose him. All of us have the potential to choose him, but unfortunately, some of us will not. And it's not that God will that, purpose that. This was his perfect will. It was God's permissible will that some perish. The scripture said he desires that none should perish, but uh, all should have eternal life. Difference between us and reform. Limited atonement. If only a few people are going to be elected, John Calvin said, Jesus only died for the elect. He didn't die for the whole world or the whole world would be saved. That's John Calvin's logic. So since the whole world isn't saved, he couldn't have died for the whole world. He only died for those who will be saved. We say he died for the sins of the whole world. He paid the price. Now, some people may pay it again, but they don't have to. He paid the price. He died for the sins of the whole world. The I stands for irresistible grace. That means if God called you, there's nothing you can do but be saved. You can't outrun, from, outrun God. If he called you, you got to be saved. The irresistible grace. We believe in provenient grace. God rules all of us. And when we give God a yes, we go into justified grace and we give God a no, he backs off for a season and comes back and woos us again with provenient grace. So uh, we don't, uh, God doesn't want a robot. God is a gentleman. God doesn't force anyone to get saved or to be lost. That's our view of God. And so it's not that we are resisting God's grace, but God is honoring human will because he doesn't want robots. He wants free moral agents who choose him. So like marriage, nobody wants to be married in a shotgun marriage. I know you see that in the TV. You want someone who wants to be with you, loves you and cares for you. God wants the same thing. He's not forcing anybody to get saved. He is wooing everybody to get saved. Irresistible grace. 
And then the last one, perseverance of the graces of the saints is uh, once saved, always saved. Uh, and the Calvin, if you're truly elect, there's nothing you can do about it. You will be truly elect. You will go to heaven no matter what. You can be a slave master, raping women, beating children, living all kinds of things, but you're going to heaven because you're elect. And if God chose not to elect somebody, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If God chose not to elect somebody and God is going to send us that person to hell, it's all right to enslave them, genocide, all of the, the you saw the slide about colonialism and all those things. They're easily justified if these people are not elect. When I was at Garrett, I didn't understand it then, but the professor was teaching on the same things I'm teaching on now. And he says, election works real well if you're in dominant culture, because everyone thinks God elected dominant culture and the benefits of being in dominant culture are the results of election. God elected all. I'm a pause. And I know some of you are brought up in reform. Have you heard that before? Or have you heard it like that before? A lot of people went to reform cemeteries, right? I was at Princeton. They talked about elect. Isn't it interesting how election becomes American, becomes manifest destiny, becomes white America, becomes Donald Trump? Because God elected them. I'm going to let you listen to a brother for a few minutes. Let's see, can we pull this last video up? Uh, put your seat belts on. Buckle up, turn your seats to the upright position, because uh, this is going to be a little rough landing here. And so I'm writing as someone who grew up uh, white and Christian uh, in, in the Deep South. I grew up Southern Baptist, uh, mostly in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and I begin the book uh, with this with this quote: um, "The Christian denomination in which I grew up." was founded on the proposition that chattel slavery could flourish alongside the gospel of Jesus Christ. Its founders believed that this arrangement was not just possible, but also divinely mandated. Uh, now, I was that kid who grew up going to church uh, in my local Baptist church um, literally five days a week. I was there really Monday through Thursday. Friday and Saturday were sort of Sabbath days of rest uh, from, going, from going to church. Um, uh, and yet, I think one of the most striking things for me as I was kind of working on this book is, is thinking back and remembering um, that uh, despite the fact that I was in church all the, all the time, every week, um, all the way even through my adolescence, um, and I went to a Baptist college uh, where I sat through um, uh, endless chapel um, uh, sessions uh, there at Mississippi College, and I went to a Southern Baptist seminary uh, where I received a, a Master of Divinity degree. Um, but it wasn't really until I was in my 20s uh, that I knew really anything about this Genesis story of my own uh, denomination. And that is that in 1845, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention was formed very specifically to allow uh, missionaries uh, to own slaves. And there was this rift between Baptists in the North and Baptists in the South. Um, yeah. And when Baptists in the North uh, uh, saw uh, someone owning other human beings as a disqualification oh, for missionary oh, service. Um, uh, the Southern churches kind of took their toys. Uh, churches uh, took their toys and went home. Uh, and essentially, yeah, but we have uh, uh, in 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention, and the name yeah, Southern really is about a kind of it is a religious secessionist movement that actually predates uh, the political secessionist movement and was actually part of the spark uh, oh, uh, for funding that. Um, you know, I, I, I recall, you know, hearing some things about Martin Luther King and then the role of black churches in organizing the civil rights movement, but virtually nothing about the critical role that white churches and leaders played in protecting the white supremacist status quo and resisting uh, the civil rights movement. Um, I went to public schools that were integrated, but not until I was uh, in, in the mid 70s when I was in, in third grade, um, where our public schools integrated nearly 20 years after Brown v. Board. Um, of education. And while I knew a number of uh, my white friends, you know, went to private schools, um, I also knew nothing about their history, that, that uh, most of them had been set up as segregation academies um, that, that were places for a, a white flight out of the public schools uh, for, for many white kids, and that, that many, many of them uh, did that with white Christian church backing. 
Um, so this is all a history that I think came to me um, fairly late um, in, in my adult life, and I've tried to kind of reckon with um, um, in, in the book and, and tell the story, um, at least through my family's history um, and through through my own experience growing up. And, you know, really the motivations for writing the book were really to just bring the truth to light, I think, um, and to tell a more truthful story. Um, and that is about how the centuries-long commitment to a social order that protected and nourished white lives at the expense of black lives became incorporated into the very fabric, into the very DNA of uh, white American Christianity. Um, and that this is true not just for the Southern branch, the Southern evangelical branch um, that I'm a part of, uh, but that it, it actually is true um, for the, the more, what's seen as the more progressive or liberal side of the white Protestant world, the mainline Protestant uh, churches, and for white Catholic uh, churches as well. Um, and, and just, you know, with a conviction that it, it's, it's just well past time for white Christians to finally uh, find the courage um, to really tell a more truthful history um, about ourselves and, and, and how that affects where we are um, today. So the main thesis that are the claim that the book, you know, puts forward is that if we really, if we read not only history, but contemporary public opinion data uh, today, that it reveals that white Christians have not just been complacent, nor just complicit, but rather as the nation's dominant cultural power, we white Christians have constructed and sustained a project of perpetuating white supremacy that has really framed the entire American story. And that the legacy of this unholy union still lives in the DNA of white Christianity today. So how does that show up uh, uh, for us uh, today? Um, so, you know, I mentioned we I look at a lot of public opinion data um, and in the book, I, I lay out, um, you know, what the, what's current public opinion tell us today, current public opinion data tell us today about where white Christians are relative to whites who are not Christian is one, um, I think, kind of clear way to kind of get a lens on the role that Christianity has played in structuring whites' um, attitudes. And then how does that sit relative to um, African-American Christian um, attitudes, uh, for example? And what the public opinion data really shows is that, um, in a nutshell, that white Christians are consistently more likely than whites who are religiously unaffiliated to deny the existence of structural racism. Um, we can see this across a whole range of, of questions. I'll give you just a couple of examples. We can unpack this more uh, in the discussion part, but um, just a couple of examples. One ripped right from the headlines uh, today, and one of them uh, is, that is that um, on, on this issue of the killing of unarmed black men by police, um, we, we find that white Christians are about 25 percentage points more likely than religiously unaffiliated whites to say the killing of unarmed black men by police are isolated incidents rather than part of a pattern of how police treat African Americans. Uh, and, and the average uh, white Christian uh, who's say, uh, a support level for, the, for saying it's a, these are isolated instances is, is about two thirds uh, who say that, um, you know, compared to um, uh, only about one in five African American uh, Christians. Um, uh, and, and, and compared to only about four in 10 white, uh, whites who are religiously unaffiliated. Um, on the issue of the Confederate flag, something else has been um, in the uh, in the news uh, quite recently uh, over the summer. Um, the, again, white Christians are about 30 percentage points more likely than religiously unaffiliated whites to say the Confederate flag is more a symbol of Southern pride uh, rather than a symbol of racism. Uh, and moreover, um, the, the, the book is using data from 2018 and 2019, um, but we went back in the field and did a follow-up study uh, just this June. So. Uh, a data that's only a few weeks old, and we find really that these attitudinal patterns persist even after uh, the protests, uh, even in the wake of the protests for racial justice that have erupted um, across the country. Uh, compared to non-religious whites, white Christians overall register much higher median scores um, on this racism index, um, and higher being more, holding more racist attitudes. So for example, white evangelical Protestants um, register eight out of 10 um, on the scale, again, with 10 being holding the most racist attitudes across these 15 questions. Uh, but here's maybe what's more surprising. Both mainline Protestants, uh, that is, uh, uh, again, those are perceived to be more progressive um, uh, and, and also less likely to be in the South, more likely to be in the upper Midwest and Northeast, um, uh, score seven out of 10. They're not far behind. And white Catholics uh, who are more urban, uh, more Northeastern uh, in their locations also score seven out of 10, and compare that to whites who are religiously unaffiliated, um, who are four out of 10, African-Americans who are two 
um, out of 10 um, on the scale. So, um, and you know, one of the things I, I, I think I hear a lot when I'm talking certainly to white Christian audiences is, is it's kind of a dismay of like, you know, well, how can this be? I think because the self-perception is um, that certainly uh, uh, white Christians, we are good people who do good things. And, uh, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, uh, having, you know, going to church is a positive um, influence uh, on, on people, but that's not in fact what the data shows. Um, uh, but if we take a closer look at the history, I'm going to say a couple of words about this, and then we'll move to the discussion. Um, you know, I think the question really moves from, well, how can this be, to um, how can this be otherwise? Um, so if we take, for example, the kind of early cultural context um, in which American Christianity, uh, again, both Protestant and Catholic was born, um, you know, as, as churches were springing up and newly settled, settled territories, and I should say, you know, uh, after Native American populations were forcibly removed. Um, it was a common practice, um, for example, I give in the book, um, the progenitor of my parents' uh, church in Macon, Georgia. Um, it was a common practice for slaveholding whites to bring in slave people to church with them. Whites sat in the front and slave um, African Americans sat in the back or in specially constructed galleries, kind of above um, the white uh, congregation. And, the, and you can imagine, if you take that seriously, as the live context um, in which um, early American Christianity was born, certainly in a nation that, um, you know, had, had, uh, that, that sort of uh, tolerated uh, um, uh, slavery uh, in, from, from its inception. Uh, and you ask the question, well, what kind of gospel could get preached um, in that setting? Or what kind of liturgy could get practiced? What kind of hymns could get sung? Um, uh, then you really see that from the very beginning uh, that, that American Christianity developed around this a priori commitment really to um, a white supremacist status quo. But, uh, but at the end of the day, I think the challenge for us is um, just trying to tell the truth, right, about who we are, uh, where we come from, and, and where we've been, and how that's contributed to, um, you know, what James Baldwin called the racial nightmare, right, that America is still living in. Thank you. Um, so my second question, in White Too Long, A Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, it contains many anecdotes and quotes describing ministers, bishops, and lay people being involved in mobs and lynchings and celebrating them in church. Talk about how they rationalized this behavior and thought it was okay uh, for Christians to behave this way. How were they able to rationalize this behavior, in, in your opinion? Yeah, it was a complex question. Um, uh, so uh, I did a little bit. Of, I kept basically followed my family's journey: Mississippi, um, Atlanta, and and and, and Georgia. Um, There's one horrific lynching in in Georgia where um, what struck me uh, is that uh, uh, the the lynching was attended uh, by uh, churchgoers from Atlanta, right? So word got out. The Atlanta Journal Constitution published that there was going to be. Uh, this lynching, uh, and there were so many people, it was on a Sunday, um, and uh, there were so many people coming from churches. They had to, the, the Atlanta terminus of the, the railroad had to put special trains together to carry the number of people going from Atlanta to Noonan, right? And, and that picked up as churches let out. Uh, people poured from the churches to the train station, men, women, children, in their Sunday clothes, and, and the conductors were shouting things like, this way to the burning, uh, right, as they were piling people onto, uh, onto cars uh, there. Uh, when you read accounts of it, it has, an, it has accounts. Uh, it, it, if, you, if you didn't know what was happening and you just read the quotes that reporters were writing coming from the crowd as this man was being tortured and killed, um, uh, Samuel Wilkes is his name, uh, you would think you read a revival meeting. Um, things like, glory, glory be to God were being shouted you know, from this very religious, very Christian uh, crowd um, as this uh, human being is being tortured um, and killed. Uh, and you know, there was, there's this, this sense that, that uh, the sense of revival like, could, took over in the spirit of, of the crowd. It, it's quite disturbing um, to see that. And then you know, to um, uh, Martin Luther King's, uh, you know, then, then if you ask, for example, um, what gets preached the Sunday after events like that, um, uh, mostly nothing. Uh, having to do with anything, right? It's business as usual uh, back, in, back in churches on the Sunday um, after the event. Uh, the Sunday after the Tulsa race massacre, uh, that just the centennial just got uh, uh, celebrated last year, uh, there's actually a record of a, bishop, a Methodist bishop that actually did preach 
uh, the following Sunday after 300 plus African Americans have been killed by roving bands of their white neighbors um, in, in Tulsa. Um, and, uh, and he takes the pulpit at the tallest steeple, Methodist Church. It's where the, the, all the civic leaders go. It's a very um, wealthy church. Uh, and he, he basically blames it on the African Americans, right? And the, uh, the crowd. That's that, and, and that he concludes uh, by saying the answer to all of this um, is that we bring more people to Christ, right? That's the kind of platitudinous, you know, uh, uh, kind of sign at, at the end. So it all gets in turn into this kind of individualism uh, that's, yeah, some, this kind of mystical relationship with, with Jesus that has nothing to do with the violence and the injustice, you know, outside. Hmm. Okay. Final reflection. And um, that's from the, that's the gentleman who wrote the book, White Too Long. White Too Long. And uh, I just pieced together some of his videos. Uh, he's in my library. Um, and he's basically saying that anything that had a birth like our white church did in America, where um, slavery was allowed and um, can't produce authentic Christianity. It just can't. <laughs> Either make the root good and the tree good or make the root evil and the tree evil, but you can't have an evil root and a good tree. I know that's hard because we love our brothers and sisters. And let me say this, the, we're talking about the practice of a religion, not any individual. There are a lot of saved whites. M my friends, a lot of saved whites. I'm not talking about that I'm talking about the teachings that they do. What you saw in um, January 6th was a lynching of the United States of America. And you see how they felt justified in doing it? That's the same thing happened in the lynching that he talked about, Samuel Witts. Okay, I'm shut up. I'm gonna let a few of you talk for a minute and then we're gonna close out. Anyone with a reflection on the video? I just want to, what, what gets me is one one thing that he said about um, what kind of sermon would you have after uh, something like that has been done? And it's like, they just go back to normal. It's like, that was just something normal to do. Like, it was nothing to it. But then at the same time, they're still praising God. It makes me wonder, who are their God? It's not the one that I serve. So, right. I mean, that, that was, I just... <laughs> It's, it's hard to soak that in, you know, to, to think about how they reacted when this actually was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we have a family at our church, a white family. They joined because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we got several white members. Um, one of my uh, ministry team members is a white, uh, Nanette Pearson. She's a white itinerant elder of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So uh, it's not about what color your skin is, it's about what you're thinking. And you're right, those who think that way have a different Jesus than we have. Dr. Pearson has the same Jesus we have. But those who think like that have a different Jesus. Anyone else? Excuse me, um, you, you mentioned, um... Uh, James Cone, right? And 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 he one of his uh, uh, books, "The Cross and the Lynching Tree." Mm -hmm. That's that kind of reminds me, you know, um, of of this video because you know uh, J James Cone really got into it and 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 he talked about you know just the love, the love of the love of Christ versus what the practice of, of some of the, you know, the, as what he talks about, some of the so-called Christians. And it's, it, it's, it's just awful. It's just awful. Like, we don't serve the same God, you know? The, the, God, the God we serve, uh, you know, is about love. You know, and 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 I I just I have a hard time trying to see how you can get love out of burning or lynching. Or, you know, it is just beyond. It's just far beyond. When when you divorce your praxis, your practice, your praxis from your doctrine, anything is possible. If I I'm going to heaven no matter what, because God elected me, I can do anything. God elected me. 
And the reason that you're suffering is because you were elected. And God did that. I had nothing to do with that. We'll rationalize that. <laughs> well, listen, I have a few things that with the uh, videos you show. There are one of the few things I would like to say is that black, we have stigma. We are black, we are poor, and we are half educated. And the videos we saw, uh, some of the Visha educated themselves. So I would suggest strongly to these students, whenever you preach, make sure you have at least one word, new word that you can add to your vocabulary. Secondly, uh, nobody wants to hear one thing over and over. I would strongly suggest that um, try to educate yourself. Age had nothing to do with education. Like some of us make it an excuse, oh, I'm too old. You can be old and still learn something. That's what I wanted to say. We're going to call on Dr. Kinley, and then we're going to close out. Um, our adjunct professor, what um, input can you give us? Parting um, wisdom. I, I will say a uh, wonderful lesson, Dr. Black, in um, how you have really administrated um, and taught on these valuable lessons. I, I, I would like to share with the candidates uh, that Dr. Black have shared very vital uh, icons, if you will, of our church that you all need to really gravitate and hear to and learn and research and gravitate um, in regard to the history and icons of our church. And then there may be some ways where you can kind of see yourself in um, their particular uh, minds or mind frame of, of how they did ministry where you now are in a, a, a presence where you can implement your particular ministry in your particular context um, while you continue to mature and, and matriculate uh, through uh, the board of the AME Church. And so I want you to really hear to, to the conversations as well as these the theological undergirding that will help you uh, to navigate with one day that you become pastors and leaders of not just your particular church, but of course, your particular community and, and context where you will be serving. And as you have uh, been aware of all of the information that you have been receiving, just know that pastors wear many hats and it's just not just preaching. Okay. Uh, you wear many hats and you have to um, find the, the liberating strength uh, to execute those things uh, that the community and the parishioners that sit in your church are looking for answers. And there are moments where um, a, a reasonable answer is, I don't know. But of course, you know, there are ways where you have to what strategize and try to do what it is necessary for you to um, get the ball moving and making sure that people are liberated in mind and so that they can understand um, all that it is within the particular uh, denomination which you are called to, which is the African Method Episcopal Church, and where you can strongly educate. Uh, let me let me put emphasis on that. That where you can strongly educate those persons who wants to know about the AME Church or who have questions about AME Church and those who um you know kind of put bad mouth on the church. You can strongly. Uh, educate them in all essence of what you are learning today so that you can also defend your church, but also be well educated enough to um, share it in a way where uh, people can really be having that aha moment about the particular church that you are called to. And then also the theological preference 
of liberation theology. And, and all of this undergirds or will coincide of what we are doing in this section of your classwork of church growth and evangelism and, and, and preaching, of course, because all of this will help you to uh, get strategic uh, strategies and as well as um, knowledge where you can um, find, if you will, uh, to help you to better your particular ministry and your viewpoints um, and your strategic planning in regard to the ministry that God has uh, chosen you to do. And the, the best thing that you need to do is understand your call and understand your purpose and understand your particular ministry, that your ministry may not look like mine's, and my ministry may not look like yours, but of course you be your authentic self. As, as Dr. Black talked about, um, uh, Turner and, and Payne, all of them have their authentic brand of ministry that make them uniquely who they are. And so while you continue to mature um, in the faith as well as through the board, find your authentic voice and your authentic skills that will help you to develop who you are um, as a, a preacher and a minister in the kingdom. And I think that's all I will say tonight. <laughs> wow, that was great. That was great. We're going to leave and I'm going to ask for a volunteer to pray us out. Um, and next week I'll be sitting in the assistant seat and uh, Dr. Kenley will be in the lead seat. Uh, who will pray us out? Well, I can pray as well. Okay. Amen. All right. Let us pray. Oh, Father, a God of grace and mercy, we thank you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for all the blessings that you have poured upon each and every one of us. We thank you for just allow, allowing us just to have the experience uh, and the wisdom from our instructor. Father, I ask that you continue to keep us, continue to order our steps as candidates so that we are walking in the direction in which you would want us to be walking in, Heavenly Father. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. And Father, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, we ask that you give us a place in your kingdom in saying, well done. So, Father, we thank you again for all that you do, for all that you've done, and by faith for all of what you are about to do with each and every one of us. And the children of God, people of God, say amen, amen, amen. and amen. 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 Go in peace. Amen. To love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Black, for an awesome session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well and thank well you all for participating. Amen. Amen. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.